very fortunate uh, to have her today to start a series of online talks on space. And uh, uh, we feel that uh, the whole motivation behind organizing this uh, online talks is to motivate students, youngsters, and space enthusiasts. And uh, I'm sure with this talk, you all will be enlightened to uh, take up space in your higher studies. And uh, with that, uh, I invite uh, Director Nehru Science Center, Dr. Umesh Rastagi, to officially introduce our today's speaker. Okay, uh, thank you, gentlemen. But this is not what we will be trying to work with. I'm in the education section of Nehru Science Center. And it's a great pleasure in fact. Good evening to all our audience here and a very good morning to uh, Dr. Rita Singh Gupta. I know Dr. Rita Singh Gupta has been on this platform on an earlier appearance also. Uh, at the design center for the Shinhamas, so Sake and uh, uh, Mr. Subhasakhe and Dr. Jaya Manak for the National Center for Science Communicators. Uh, that's also a part of uh, this uh, organization uh, and because this is program is being offered by uh, National Center for Science Communicators, Space Age, and Nano Science Center together. In fact, initially we planned for a very small uh, program because the still the COVID uh, restrictions are there. But now it is more bit of the next one because there are five uh, lectures uh, work by one uh, they have confirmed that we have accommodated all of them. So, uh, while thanking uh, all these organizations uh, uh, to give us this opportunity and uh, appreciating with us, uh, let me introduce uh, for our audience uh, Dr. Amita Singh Gupta briefly. Uh, she is a veteran of the space program and basically a rocket scientist, a space engineer, professor, who is involved for the last uh, over 30 years, uh, 20 years, in uh, developing technologies that are unable the exploration of Mars, asteroid, and deep space. Uh, while starting a uh, career working on the launch vehicles and communication satellites at uh, Boeing Space and Communications, then uh, followed at NASA, with Dr. Uh, this is focused on developing the ion engines, particularly, uh, uh, the power the down the spacecraft to reach rest time series for the surface asteroids uh, in the main asteroid belt. Launched in 2006. Uh, she also worked on the supersonic parachute system of and Stanley Plane that was integral to the landing of a Curiosity rover on Mars in 2012. And I think uh, today's talk is also related with that and Dr. Nitin's sharing her experience. From 2012 to 2017, she led the development of the cold platform WT, a laser pulling quantum physics facility, which is now on board. The International Space Station, probably everybody must be aware about this. Many of us are following it lately and uh, taking that uh, um, fact uh, timing. Then, uh, surely, the development of an in vacuum magnetically levitating, electrically propelled high speed transportation system is known as Hyperloop. And I well remember she had given a talk on this Hyperloop on our platform earlier. Uh, current venture is leading the development of hydrogen fuel cell. Our aircraft that she knew and found out I could get limited. Uh, this is focus in supersonic movement, mitigation technology, sustainable aviation, and mass media technology. But she also is a science educator and communicator, and that's why uh, we keep bothering her because uh, that's what our uh, USP is. We are communicating science, we are popularizing science. Professor Gupta is uh, also a research associate professor at the University of Southern California. She teaches the only uh, sorry, uh, yeah, entry, descent, and landing class on the West Coast for visual visuals in the aeronautics and space technology department. She is also a professional public speaker and send outreach uh, advocate. She promotes events around the world, sharing with the audience her personal and professional experiences of owning the red planet and from flying to a solar mass. Clearly, in itself, uh, she can be described with this. Main words, explored by her, in engineered by Kelly. So I think uh, with this brief introduction, uh, I will uh, uh, it over to Sunita Mani Pariyadi uh, to take the program for her. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I think we are, we are we all are eagerly waiting now for the talk. And uh, with that, I invite Dr. Anita Singh Gupta to take over the floor. Good evening, and thank you for the kind introduction. And it's lovely to see you all. It's been too long. Looking forward to coming back in person soon. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining me this evening and spending your Friday evening talking about Mars. Um, I think I don't need to go through the introduction anymore, um, but we're going to talk specifically about Mars exploration this evening. And let's see. Um, so just a little bit of my background as a young person. Um, I wasn't born in the United States. I was born in the United Kingdom. My father uh, was from West Bengal, and then he went to the United Kingdom to study his PhD in mechanical engineering, where he met my mother. Um, and then very soon after, we moved to New York State, um, and I grew up for the most part in the United States. I got my BS, MS, and PhD in aerospace engineering. Um, I actually slightly wrong with my PhD from the University of Southern California. Uh, I spent most of my career working at NASA, and I think it's very important as young people when you think about your trajectory, um, it's not just about your job, it's about all the things that you'd like to do. So I spend a lot of time with my hobbies as well, one of which, of course, is traveling, public speaking, riding motorcycles, and flying airplanes. Um, so you got to have very good uh, work-life balance. And one of the things that I've had the great opportunity to do in my career is work on many different projects. And most of these weren't given to me to work on, but I recognized an opportunity and I went out and sought out that opportunity, whether that was my first job at Boeing working on launch vehicles or my 16 years working at NASA on a variety of different programs and then afterwards leaving for the green transportation space to work on the hyperloop and to work on my own electric aviation company. So you have to recognize different opportunities that you see during the course of your career, both as a student as well as when you get into the working world. And as you mature as a person, whether you are an engineer, a scientist, or anything else, it's always good to lead by example. And so at the second half of my career, I decided to go into more leadership roles as an executive at Virgin Hyperloop, then as a um, executive at a electric vertical takeoff and London aircraft company, and now as a CEO of my own company. And I also do work in the emergency service area as a captain with the Civil Air Patrol, um, helping to look for lost hikers and downed aircraft. So in your life, always think of ways that you can lead to make a difference to help other people. Um, but ultimately, the career of engineering is a very popular career amongst uh, people in India, just like my father, and I followed in his footsteps. And when people ask me what an engineer is, I think I have a pretty easy way of describing it, which engineers are inventors, um, they're adventurers, and they're problem solvers. And you use math and science to come up with technologies to create solutions to difficult problems and ultimately to improve the quality of life for people. You could be an aerospace engineer like me, you could be an electrical engineer who's working on the development of the next type of telecommunications equipment, such as mobile phones and computers, or you can even be a biomedical engineer who works on imaging equipment or the development of new organs, new um, you know, prosthetic limbs, or even new drugs uh, such as the vaccines that we saw under development for uh, the COVID pandemic, which is going on around the world. So it's a really amazing career, and it couples pretty much every economic sector and every discipline of science, depending upon what you might be interested in. But what I do um, as an aerospace engineer is twofold. One, I can develop next generation of aircraft that you see here with a spider jet, and I am actually working on the development of a new type of aircraft power plant as we speak with my company, but you also can develop spacecraft technologies which allow you to explore other worlds. And I think many people around the world are familiar with the work that NASA does because it's explored so many different you know, planets and moons in our solar system, and this here is a set of images of a spacecraft um, known as Cassini, uh, which went to the Saturn system and deployed an entry probe called Huygens, which landed on the surface of Titan. It was the first time it was ever done. Um, it was a very complicated system that you can see represented by the artist's picture in the middle, but it was successful, represented by the picture on the left, which is actually an image of the surface of Titan. And now, many decades later, we're going to be sending another mission to the surface of Titan called Dragonfly, which is going to fly around on an octocopter. So you can see how um, there are many fascinating scientific space explorations that can happen um, just in our own solar system. And perhaps one of the most interesting places in our solar system is Europa, which is one of the moons of the Jupiter system. And we believe that it has a liquid 
ocean of water beneath perhaps a 10 kilometer thick layer of ice. And so we don't know what's in that water, but we might find the first life forms that exist in our solar system in the ocean on Europa. And perhaps it won't be life forms that are like us, but maybe we'll find something like microorganisms or maybe even types of fish in that ocean. So there are so many fascinating places in our solar system that we haven't yet visited in terms of living on the surface and we've only done sort of a quick flyby, which as you can see is in a tier taken by the Galileo spacecraft, which visited Jupiter. Um, and another location in the solar system, which I think is going to become an area of active research, is to visit Enceladus, which is another moon of the Saturnian system that actually has a geyser erupting um, from the surface of the moon, which has large holes of um, organics in them, so you don't know what that's going to be. Uh, but ultimately, the goal for every engineer is to dare mighty challenges, um, accept those challenges, and create new technologies. And back in 2006, I was invited to join the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity Rover team to develop, and develop a supersonic parachute, which I did. And we created this video called Seven Minutes of Terror, which I'll play here. I have to do a, um, I think, a share to optimize the video. So give me one second and share sound. If it doesn't work, let me know. And then I'll just stop it and, and, and move on. So let's see if it works. When people look at it, uh, it looks great. This is one that. Choice, we might cut it off and come down the rockets. 
Don't get someone to walk the others off. You want to do something. You need to snap their back into the parachute. So the first thing you do is make this really radical bender and move. Fly off to the side. Converting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity. Getting it over, moving straight up and down so we can look at the surface of the ground and see where we're going to land. And straight down to the bottom of the planet. The right to side, six claw of the high line. We can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rotor with the damage mechanisms and the damage issues. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky cam. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rotor velocity on a heavy. It's 21 feet long. And then gently deposit on a seat. Honestly. As the water touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage is in a collision course with the rope. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage away to a safe distance from the road. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me again. Uh, that was a video that described the engineering challenges behind us landing the Curiosity rover on Mars. And it worked so well, obviously, in, uh, back in 2012, that we used it again for landing the Perseverance rover system just this past year, uh, with very few changes, actually. So when you can develop a new capability like that to SkyCrate, it makes sense to use it again and again in the future. Um, and may even be used for scaled-up, souped-up version for landing people on the surface of Mars one day. Uh, but I think one of the things that I get asked a lot as I give a presentation on Mars exploration is why we're so interested in Mars. And there's several reasons. One of the reasons, of course, is the planetary science um, question, which is, how did Earth come to be the way it is? How did Mars come to be the way that it is? And how did Venus come to be the way that it is? And this image that you see here in the slide are Venus on the left, Earth in the middle, Mars on the right, compared to each other. But at the beginning of the formation of these planets in our solar system, known as the terrestrial planets, they were actually very similar to each other in terms of having water on the surface and in terms of having um, an atmosphere. But over the course of the past four to five billion years, they've evolved quite differently. Where Venus now has a very um, thick atmosphere of density, high surface temperature, close to 500 degrees centigrade, 100 times the atmospheric pressure on the surface of Earth. And then Mars, on the other hand, has a surface pressure only 1% of what we have here on Earth and has a very thin atmosphere and has no appreciable water on the surface. So clearly, you can have planetary level, level uh, changes, uh, change. which can completely destroy the habitability of a world. And so by analyzing and exploring neighboring planets, such as Venus and Mars, we can learn more about Earth and in terms of planetary climate change. And it really does help us to understand our place in the universe. But of course, the other reason um, is we also want to one day explore other worlds in our solar system. And it turns out Mars is not a bad place to set up our first human colony because of the resources that we have access to. And I'll talk a little bit more about that that later. But from a planetary science perspective, when we take a look at Mars, it's actually had a very active geological history. And so we can learn from the past of that planet. And for example, the image that you see on the upper left, Olympus Mons, is the largest extinct volcano or volcano at all in our solar system. Uh, it's about three times as high as Mount Everest, which means that at some point in the past, Mars had a lot of volcanic activity at a very active tectonic um, substructure, but now it appears to have stopped. And then and similarly, on the bottom, Bellus Marineris um, is sort of like Mars's version of the Grand Canyon. It's about six times as deep as our Grand Canyon, which means there was likely pretty active water flows on the surface of Mars in its past, which now, of course, are gone today. 
And so the scientific question we ask is, how did that happen? And one of the hypotheses as to how that happened is that a long time ago, probably around 4 billion years ago, there was an asteroid that impacted uh, the planet Mars, which then shattered its molten core, because basically the planet was like a magnet. And when that magnet was shattered inside the planet, its magnetic field was disrupted, the atmosphere was ripped off, the water was then you know, boiled away, essentially, um, and we see the planet that we see today. And so by sending spacecraft to orbit, orbit the planet and by sending rovers to drive around on the surface of the planet and make scientific measurements, we can test some of these hypotheses to understand what happened. Um, and we de indeed have had a rover recently known as um, InSight that has made measurements of the um, seismic activity on the surface of the planet and con confirmed that it is still present, but obviously at a much reduced state. And so one of the questions that I would like to ask if we were in person um, is if people believe if there's water flowing on the surface of Mars today. And in fact, there is water flowing on the surface of Mars. It's not a lot, and it's in the form of wet mud that you can see in the animated GIF on the lower right with those black streaks, and you can see in the black streaks off the cliff face on the upper right. Um, and the reason for this is because that Mars is tilted on its axis, just like Earth is, and so as it goes around the sun in its orbit, the planet actually heats up and cools down. So if there are frozen aquifers of water beneath the subsurface, some of that water will heat up, turn into a liquid, and then seep out the sides of these cliff faces that you see here. Um, and then the image on the lower right is actually a false color image where we were able to use a spectroscopic instrument on a spacecraft orbiting Mars to determine that those streaks are indeed water, that there's water present in them. And that was actually a discovery made by a graduate student. So for those of you on the line who are either in middle school or high school or starting college, these are the types of discoveries that you could be responsible for very early in your career. And I think that's pretty exciting. And so one of the most difficult things to do that I've spent many years developing and now teaching about is how to land on Mars. It's very difficult to do. We have successfully done that as the human species nine times. It's only been done successfully by the U.S. space program until very, very recently where China also landed a rover on Mars. So I should actually update this to 10 times. Um, it was done first in the 1970s with a Viking lander, which is the picture on the lower left. And then it was done um, again in the 1990s with a Pathfinder Sojourner rover. Uh, and then again in the early 2000s with Spirit and Opportunity. Phoenix in the mid 2000s, Curiosity, the mission that I worked on in 2012, and then Insight in 2018, and then Mars Perseverance uh, most recently in 2020. And I will up this to include the update this to include the Chinese River as well. And so the images that you see here are images taken by these platforms on the surface of Mars at their landing sites, which I think is a very interesting view, especially when it's shown in color, because it looks very similar to places in the desert here on Earth, with the exception of the red tinged looking atmosphere. And so we keep on sending rovers here of increasing complexity because a more complex system can gain more interesting access to different places on the surface, as well as make more interesting scientific measurements. And this particular image, what you can see here is the evolution of rover technologies over the course of the past 20 years, starting with a little toy side rover on the lower left, like a little Tonka truck or some kind of toy car that you might drive around, um, to something the size of, you know, a washing machine, which was spirit and opportunity to something the size of a small car, which was Curiosity as well as Perseverance. Those two rovers were essentially the same as each other. And so as you have a larger platform with a bigger wheelbase, you can carry more equipment on your back. You can do more science. You can have bigger wheels. You can go over more difficult terrain to more interesting scientific locations. And so you can learn from the past, build a future, um, evolve the technology, and are able to do more interesting science as a result. Um, and you can think about this in a more holistic sense is how you can make each chapter of your career a building block for your future. So whether you're in middle school or high school and college, each one of those chapters of your educational career lead to a more interesting future for you downstream. But when we think about the purpose of the mission of Curiosity, it really was to determine whether or not Mars could have once supported life in its past and whether or not it could support life there today on the surface of the planet or in the subsurface of the planet. And we do this by making a variety of different scientific measurements, specifically understanding the presence of organics, taking a look at the types of rocks that exist and how they formed, whether they formed in the presence of water or whether they formed volcanically, for example, and also making measurements of surface radiation to understand 
understand um, whether or not, you know, the radiation level is too extreme for life forms to live on the surface today. Therefore, they might be in the subsurface um, to protect themselves from the radiation. And so we do that with a series of scientific measurements. But we also have to pick a good landing site location. So landing site selection is a really important part of any mission to Mars because you want to find something which is scientifically interesting. And the graphic on the upper left here, um, you can see the location of where the Spirit and Opportunity rovers landed, and then on the right, the location of where uh, the Curiosity rover landed. They landed very far away from each other, so each time we send another mission, we try not to do the same thing. We go to a different location, we collect more information, and with Perseverance, it's going to yet another uh, location, Jezero Crater, and it's collecting uh, data which will help to inform future human missions to the surface. But when we take a look at a three-dimensional view of the location of the landing for Curiosity in the lower right, it is essentially a crater um, with a mountain in the middle, and we believe it was the site of a former ancient, um, basically, uh, river or, or water body. So looking, once again, for past evidence of organic life and the sedimentary rock layers that form in the presence of water. And all of these measurements will help us to eventually enable future human exploration and, in the near term, sample collection, which is what the Perseverance rover is doing in Jezero Crater. So this is another view of what that landing site looks like. And now if you think about this from a, um, a landing accuracy perspective, all those hundreds of millions of miles away um, on Earth, you have to have the accuracy to land in a location basically the size of a city, about uh, 10 kilometers um, in size. And that requires you to have sort of a bullseye landing accuracy when you think over those vast distances, which is where the complexity of the landing system comes in. And of course, you have to be accurate because if you weren't, Number one, you wouldn't make it to the location you wanted to get to, but the worst part was you might accidentally, you know, land in the size of a mountain or the side of the crater wall, and then you wouldn't have a mission to do. So that's the reason why you have to have an accurate landing location. And the way we do this is by having a vehicle called an entry vehicle that you see in the image on the left here, which generates a lot of aerodynamic drag, which means that once it feels the atmosphere, once it touches the atmosphere, it starts to slow down due to aerodynamic drag. So if you don't know what aerodynamic drag is, I can give you a pretty simple answer. If you were driving in a car down the road quickly or in a bus or in a train and you put your hand out that window, you would feel this force on your hand. That's aerodynamic drag. So when you're entering Mars, Mars's atmosphere at incredibly fast speeds, in this case, you know, you know, uh, over 12,000 miles an hour, um, you feel a lot of aerodynamic drag. And this particular shape of the vehicle it is very draggy. It's intended to produce a lot of aerodynamic drag. So that's how you slow yourself down. But although it doesn't look like it, this body also generates some lift, like an airplane, which is the reason why I'm showing a bird on the right-hand side. And when you have lift, you can use that lift to help you to control your trajectory. And so this strange-looking shape generates lift. It has an angle of attack, just like an airplane does, and it allows you to basically fly like this towards the surface uh, to reduce some of the aerodynamic loads that you experience and to better control your position to your landing point in that bullseye location that I showed you earlier. So I've got one more video to show you, and I'm just going to let it play without sharing the sound. I'll talk over it. Um, so basically, you're coming in 20,000 kilometers per hour into the Martian atmosphere, which is about 30 times as fast as an airplane, five times as fast as a bullet. You slow down with aerodynamic drag to around you know, 1,500 kilometers per hour. Then you deploy a very large supersonic parachute. I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute, which slows you down further to around you know, 300, um, 400 kilometers per hour. At that point, you've actually hit terminal velocity on the parachute, so it can't do anything for you. So you cut away that parachute, and then you do your descent to the surface on a series of retro rockets. Once again, slowing yourself down with the supersonic exhaust plumes towards the ground. Um, also making measurements as you approach the ground in terms of your height above the ground, in terms of your uh, precision to where you want to land on the ground, and making some corrections with those um, motors to give you thrust vector control. When you get uh, just above the surface, the sky crane maneuver started where the rover is lower on a tether, and it touches wheels down on the surface very softly, very slowly, so it's safe for the rover. And that platform above has done its job. It cuts those tethers. It flies away. It crash lands at the safe distance. And now you've successfully landed the rover on the surface. This was the landing technique that was used for Curiosity, and it's also the landing technique that was used for Perseverance more recently.
very successful in both instances um, and very efficient in terms of being able to land this very large uh, rover the size of a car basically on the surface of Mars and we intend to use it uh, multiple times in the future because if something works why not use it and then what you also notice on this rover is there is a different type of power system from subsequent rovers which is a nuclear power source we'll talk about that a little bit more later um, but my role on the mission and an area of expertise I have is in the development of parachute systems. And parachutes are basically very large textile devices which generate a lot of aerodynamic drag. Think about an umbrella in the wind and how it, you know, basically, well, you feel that force. <laughs> a parachute like this is incredibly big. You can see the size of the people beneath this particular parachute. We use the same parachute for the Curiosity as well as the Perseverance rover. Um, but on Mars, because the atmosphere is so thin, you have to deploy it above the speed of sound, in this case, two times above the speed of sound. So experience a lot of force on it because of those fast speeds. And so this is one video of a parachute test that we conducted. So you get an idea of it's deployed from a helicopter. It then inflates, um, in this case, in Earth's atmosphere to do this test so that you can make sure that it opens up safely and that it uh, generates the amount of aerodynamic drag that it's supposed to to slow you down. So it gives you the performance that you're looking for. And that was a successful test that we conducted all those years ago. And also everyone on the line should realize that when you are an engineer, you are part of a team. So when you conduct a program like this, it's not just you working by yourself, you're working with your own team. In this case, our parachute team is part of a larger team, which for us was the entry descent landing team and part again of another larger team which is the entire mission team and then depending upon what you're doing you'll work on different phases of the mission so i worked on the development the design phase and the test phase but i didn't work on the operations phase there's usually another team that comes in to do operations so you could work on all of those things some of those things kind of whatever you want but ultimately teamwork is what solves every challenge and enables you to create these really complex systems and so what's really important about each one of these missions is building in new technologies for the future. Um, and what you can see here is both, this is the same for both the Curiosity and the Perseverance rover, is that it had an advanced power system. Specifically, it had a nuclear power source, a radioisotope uh, thermoelectric generator, which generates electricity um, all the time due to the production of heat and dissimilar materials, an effect known as, as the thermionic effect, um, which allows you to generate electricity. So basically it has this big nuclear thermal battery, which gives you a lot of power, which can keep the rover warm during the nighttime and it can provide electricity to run its instruments during the day. Um, and this was a, uh, a, a system that was developed for Curiosity and of course um, uh, is used by Perseverance as well. And it gives the rover more options in terms of where it can go on the surface, how many hours it can operate, the times of year that it can operate because obviously Mars has seasons just like Earth does and the amount of of power it has available to conduct scientific experiments as well as communications and to keep itself warm. So one of the things that we have to think about, um, you know, maybe not so much for robotic space programs, the time that it takes to get to Mars, but when we eventually send people to Mars, we have to think about what their journey is going to be like to get from point A to point B. And on the minimum energy trajectory, it takes between seven to nine months, which is a very long time, but it's about the length of a school year that all of you go through, whether you're in middle school, high school, or in college. And um, we've all kind of been stuck in a constrained space for the past year and a half because of COVID. So we're all kind of used to what that journey to Mars would be like in terms of sitting in front of our computers um, and doing things remotely away from other people. And so we can see that it's not that bad. It's something that we can probably do. And ironically, it's the length of time between the gestation period of a sloth, which you see on the left, and a human baby that you see on the right. And so when we launched our mission in 2011, you know, nine months later, we made it to the surface of Mars. And one of the technologies that we put onto the Curiosity mission, which enabled an even more precise landing for the subsequent Perseverance mission was a camera on the underside of the rover, no Marty, um, which took pictures as it approached the surface that I'll show you here. So this is an actual video of the descent towards the surface of Mars. What you're seeing is the heat shield falling away. And now you're seeing the base of the crater, in this case, Gale Crater, and you're kind of seeing black regions on the surface. This is evidence of past volcanic activity in this particular crater. And you're also seeing sort of um, 
uh, what would you call them, craters within craters, like pockmarks on the surface, which is because meteorites are able to get through the atmosphere on Mars more easily and they don't burn up completely, so they crash land in the ground. And you're also seeing sort of the motion back and forth, um, which is because this is the rover hanging underneath the parachute as it descends towards the ground. So now it's getting closer and closer to the ground, so you can see um, higher resolution images of the surface. And soon what you're going to see is the shaking motion stops because the parachute gets cut away. And then that power descent on rocket engines or motors um, begins to start which you'll see in just a moment. And so all this, this was a technology demonstration activity for the Curiosity mission. We used the same camera and the software associated with it to do hazard avoidance during the terminal descent on the Perseverance mission, which allowed it to have a, be able to land in a more difficult location, basically. So now what you're seeing is we're descending towards the surface, slowing down on our rocket engines, and eventually the sky crane maneuver will start. You'll see the rover's wheel come into view as it's released. There you go, on the upper left. And you'll also start to see that now you can't really see the surface. That's because these rocket engines are firing into essentially a sand pit and generating a lot of debris as you approach the surface. Now the rover has touched down and it has completed its entry, descent, and landing maneuver. This is what both Curiosity and Perseverance look like. The first thing that it has to do after it lands is send a picture of where it landed. So we tell everyone back at Mission Control at home that it's okay. Um, and so these are the images that we saw post-landing. Um, and you can see that mountain in the middle, which is mountain image and you can also see it on the right hand side in a color image and you can see how even though it is the surface of another planet it does look very similar to many places in desert regions here on earth and so that's because the planets the terrestrial planets are so similar to each other which i mentioned earlier at the beginning of the talk and so as an engineer, we do a lot of calculations. We do a lot of simulations to make sure that what we design is going to work, both in terms of structurally, as well as in terms of landing accuracy. So I mentioned before that um, we wanted to land in a circle in an ellipse region so that we stayed within um, the region of safety. And so what you see here on the lower right, it, kind of in red is that landing ellipse, the calculation that we made, and the white box you see is where we actually landed. So we did a really good job at predicting what the performance was going to be like during the entry, descent, and landing, which is completely autonomous. There's no human being in the loop for that because there can't be because there's time delay between Earth and Mars. And then on the upper left, you can see the location of where um, the rover landed in the in green and the place of where ultimately it drove to over the course of several years. And gosh, it's almost uh, 10 years later now, um, which is the lower reaches of Mount Sharp, because that was going to be the most interesting scientific information. And then we got this image for both uh, Curiosity and Perseverance, which is the uh, rover descending under the parachute. This is taken by a spacecraft, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is an orbit around Mars. You can position it so that it takes a picture during the descent. This is yet further data data that we can use after the fact to understand how the trajectory went. Um, and we did see a lot of landing site alteration as a result of all the gas coming out of the motors, kicking up um, the soil, uh, and that is to be expected. And the image on the top left is basically before the cover is removed from a camera, and then the image on the upper right is after the cover is removed from the camera. So all the dirt is gone now. And you can see a nice sunny day on Mars with Mount Sharp um, in the distance. And on the bottom image there, you can see kind of how you burned <laughs> a portion of the ground where the rover landed. And and the good news, of course, is that this isn't a very sandy location, so you didn't dig yourself into a hole. If it was a sandy location, then it would have been a slightly different landing type scenario. So pretty much it's just a small layer of dirt on the surface and pretty hard material beneath that. Um, so one of the really important portions of any Mars mission is to do a future uh, landing site assessment for future human missions. And so an instrument that the rover has is um, a laser uh, spectrometer device, which actually shoots a laser into rocks and into soil, vaporizes them. And by looking at the spectroscopic signature, you can figure out what elements are present um, in these rocks. And what we confirmed you know, definitively is that Mars has all the building blocks for life as we know it in terms of elements that we have here on Earth, and that was a, obviously a really important finding, and this is a very a useful technique. Um, we also have a weather station on board, so we're able to make measures of daily me measurements of temperature and pressure, and as you would expect, 
on the upper right, you see variations during the daytime, during the nighttime, just like you do here on Earth. And then you can correlate those temperature variations back to the radiation levels that we see on the surface. And what this means is that the atmosphere helps to attenuate some of that radiation coming in from space, whether it's from the sun or whether it's from galactic cosmic radiation in deep space. The bad news is the radiation levels are very high, which means that human beings would have to have something to protect them on the surface. They could go subterranean, for example, or limit their exposure. But the good news is now we know what the radiation levels are. So we can design habitats and spacesuits and radiation shields to protect future human inhabitants um, on the surface of Mars, you know, living in um, pressurized environments. But the future, so the future is basically what you are all going to be working on if you choose to become space program engineers. And of course, the future most recently in the context of Mars exploration was the Perseverance rover. So Perseverance had to get another mission, which was to demonstrate more technologies to support future human exploration and to collect collect a sample for a future Mars sample return mission. But the rover itself is the same in terms of how it looks, its size, its mobility system, its power source, its telecommunications assist, uh, equipment. It's basically a build to print of the Curiosity rover because if something gets broke, uh, why fix, isn't broke, why fix it? It, of course, had a helicopter a platform or a rotorcraft. Um, this is the first time electric flight has been conducted on the surface of another planet. And it successfully completed, I believe, 14 flights today. And it's used as a technology demonstration platform, but also used as a reconnaissance device to get early images of where you might want to drive to next. But what I really am interested in now is what technology is needed to put the first humans on Mars, because that is a bit of a quantum leap. And so what we need, of course, is the ability to travel beyond low Earth orbit in a capsule that is underway with the development of the Orion vehicle, which is a NASA funded project, which has many industry partners, including Lockheed. Martin. Um, and I spent several years developing a portion of the parachute system for that, the drogue parachute. And it kind of looks like Apollo, but it's a bigger version of Apollo and it has more modern materials, which allows it to be basically lighter weight compared to Apollo. But the shape is just like Apollo. And that's because it's meant to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. So once again, it has to produce aerodynamic drag. It has to have a heat shield on it. It has to be able to you know, tolerate those entry loads that it would experience. One of the biggest challenges though that we have for future human exploration of Mars is radiation. So I mentioned a little bit about the radiation on the surface of Mars, but we also have to worry about the radiation during the interplanetary cruise between Earth and Mars. So when we live here on Earth, we are protected by our atmosphere, one, but we're also protected by our magnetic field because we've got a rotating molten core that creates this magnetic dynamo. And we have these things called the Van Allen radiation belts which actually protect us from high energy particles coming in either from the sun or galactic cosmic radiation. Once you leave the protection of Earth, once you leave the protection of um, those Van Allen belts, you're now exposed to radiation. So in uh, International Space Station, it's not that bad because it's still being protected by our magnetic field. But once you get into that cruise region, uh oh, you got to do something about it. Um, and so you need some kind of radiation shield. And so that technology doesn't exist yet. So that's something that has to be developed. And I am a huge science fiction fan. So sometimes I look towards science fiction for inspiration. And everybody knows in Star Trek, if you watch Star Trek, they have shields up, which is essentially a magnetic shield. So it's likely the case that we'll have to develop some kind of magnetic shielding technology for future human missions to travel in interplanetary space over long distances. Because remember that cruise time is between seven to nine months. But when we get to Mars, we can go subterranean and actually use the Martian soil to help us. Now, it's a fact human beings are very weak when you compare us to robots, for example, right? We're not made of metal. We're made of organics, which tends to degrade in the presence of all kinds of things, including vacuum and radiation, both of which you have to deal with in space. So it's probably the case that we're going to rely on robotic um, explorers to do a lot of the dirty work, both in our cruise towards Mars, as well as on the surface of the planet. So artificial intelligence is going to be a very important field that is going to be used in space exploration program because we'll have smart robots to do the setting up of the habitats and the maintenance of you know, different systems um, on the spacecraft, outside the spacecraft, on the surface of Mars, you know, outside of the habitat. And of course, there are many of these robotic platforms at development and private industry, as well as at NASA. And so this is me at NASA Johnson Space Center, um, taking some pictures with Robonaut, for example. Um, now, one of the other more 
human things that we have to think about when we send people to explore other worlds is how are we going to eat when we get there? What are we going to eat? Are we going to bring all of our food with us or are we going to grow some of our food um, whilst we're there? And realistically, we're absolutely going to have to grow our food there. Why would we not want to, right? Because you can only bring so much mass with you on the cruise. And so it's likely the case that we're going to set up a bunch of greenhouses, subterranean under the surface of Mars, fed by sunlight coming in through fiber optics. And guess what? Plants use CO2, which is what the Martian atmosphere is, and then they'll generate oxygen for us. We can even use those plants to help give us additional oxygen that we need um, to power these habitats with breathable air uh, for its human inhabitants. And it also means that largely people will have to be vegetarians um, because where would you get the meat from? <laughs> which is fine because I'm a vegetarian. And I think probably a lot of people um, out there nowadays are vegetarians as well. But guess what? We also have work underway in this area. So on the International Space Station, there's an experiment called the veggie experiment in which uh, plants are grown hydroponically um, in the microgravity environment of space. And so they've demonstrated the growth of lettuce so far. Bad news is they don't look like the best lettuce plants. It turns out need a gravity vector to know which way is up and which way is down. In in the International Space Station, there essentially is no gravity. It's a microgravity environment. So plants struggle to grow efficiently. But on Mars, of course, you've got about one third the gravity of Earth, so you won't have those same types of problems. But we have successfully demonstrated the veggie experiment, which could be used to grow food during the interplanetary cruise, and certainly could be used to grow food when you're on the surface of Mars in a pressurized habitat. But the first humans on Mars will absolutely have to live in habitation modules, because as I mentioned earlier, the surface density is only 1%, what we have on Earth. Um, and uh, the atmosphere is CO2, so we have to be able to create our own air supply, which you know we need the oxygen from to be able to survive. And these are some examples of what it could look like. And there are even people doing research now in terms of the psychological effects of being in one of these small enclosed spaces. And they do this in Arctic regions on Earth to have a parallel or an analogous experience for people uh, living in these constrained, constrained spaces far away from you know, civilization. Uh, but how would you grow food? Many years ago, I actually worked with space architects on setting up what a Martian colony would look like. And part of that was creating these greenhouses um, and using Martian materials, using Martian sunlight, using Martian CO2 to help you support um, the development of these plants. And this is an idea of what one of these sort of like uh, deployable, inflatable um, habitats would look like. Um, this also gives you an example of what the the living environment like be like. So it's going to be a small space because you can only bring so much material with you, but you can come up with ways to efficiently use space so that people feel comfortable and happy inside by choosing the correct colors and things like that. Um, and so we, once again, we worked with space architects to develop what some of these um, inside uh, habitats would look like. But if you go and visit anywhere, right, you're going to want to drive around and check things out. So we would also need to have transportation on the surfaces of Mars, and it would have to be transportation in a pressurized uh, vehicle because there isn't any air um, and it's low pressure. So you'd have to pressurize it with air to, let's say, maybe 10 PSI or something like that. And so even these vehicles are under development at NASA. So this is one um, at NASA Johnson Space Center. It's an electric vehicle. So in this case, it's battery powered, but it's likely that we would probably go with something like hydrogen power or hydrogen fuel cells, which is something that I'm interestingly working on now with my company um, for basically mobility solutions on the surface of the moon um, or on the surface of Mars. And you could either choose to wear spacesuits with an unpressurized cabin, or you could choose to go in a shirt sleeves environment, pressurize the vehicle um, so that you can drive around more safely. And it's likely that you would go with the latter. Um, but ultimately, there's a nice parallel between the desire um, to be sustainable here on Earth with the necessity to be sustainable here on Earth and the absolute necessity to be sustainable on the surface of Mars. And it's a technique called in situ resource um, utilization, ISRU, where you use the environment, you basically live off the land. And so you can do that from a power perspective with solar panels or a solar farm. You could do that um, 
uh, for radiation protection by living underground subterranean or creating habitats made out of Martian soil bricks. Water, you could tap into some of those subsurface aquifers that I mentioned before, melt that water so you have water for drinking and eating and growing plants. And you can also use electrolysis to split up that water to make hydrogen and oxygen, which can provide, once again, power for fuel cells as well as rocket fuel to be able to take off the surface of Mars that you see on the upper right there. Or you could use Martian CO2 and hydrogen to create methane, which is another type of rocket fuel, which is storable um, you know, inter at room temperature. And then the final one is the growing of plants that are specifically designed to need very little oxygen, uh, use tons of CO2, and then produce oxygen with photosynthesis. And those are called extremophiles. And so that's another way of producing your own oxygen um, on the surface uh, of the planet. But so what we're headed to now is with Perseverance, it's caching a sample. That sample will then be picked up in a future Mars sample return mission, which is probably, you know, uh, five, no, I'd say probably around 10 years away from happening. That sample we brought back to Earth and analyzed. And in the meantime, we're developing all these technologies that I just showed to facilitate future human um, transit cruise, and then entry, descent, and landing on the surface of Mars with the goal, perhaps in the next hundred years, to actually have colonies of people living sustainably for long periods of time on the surface of Mars. Um, and to wrap up the presentation, this is your future. This is something that you can do in your career if you're interested in this. Mars exploration is going to be, especially human Mars exploration, is going to be an international endeavor, which means space agencies around the world working together, companies around the world working together, pooling their resources in terms of money and in terms of equipment and in terms of expertise to make this happen. And so part of the reason why I like to give these talks is to inspire you to become engineers and scientists so that you could be part of this future um, uh, of um, exploration. So I think I probably have uh, a few minutes left uh, for questions and um, yes, thank you very much. Oh, and I sh would say that you can certainly follow me on Twitter if you use social media at doc doctor underscore Astro. And I also have a Facebook page, um, which is um, facebook.com slash Dr. Anita Sengupta. But I'm sure um, you know somebody can provide those to you later um, for social media after the fact. But thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anita Singh Gupta. The, your talk uh, on Mars has been very enlightening. And I'm sure all students who are attending this talk from all over India, they, they will be inspired and uh, they will take up journey in STEM areas. So with that, uh, our talk is now open for uh, question and answer. And uh, I can already see that there are many questions. So I'll start with question by Adinath. Uh, he's saying as only 1% atmosphere present on the, at uh, in the, as there is only, maybe he means uh, there is less percent of oxygen in the Martian atmosphere, how we can survive on Mars. So we wouldn't be able to survive without either bringing oxygen with us and living inside of a pressurized habitat or basically creating oxygen from getting access to that subsurface H2O using an electrolyzer to split it up and get oxygen, growing plants, extremophiles, which produce oxygen, but we would have to somehow either create oxygen or bring it with us and live inside these pressurized habitats, or we can put it inside spacesuits, but we would never be able to live in a shirt sleeves environment on the surface at this point in time. Okay, there is one question on the parachute system uh, by uh, Kanche. Uh, he's saying, uh, why does the parachute did not uh, get tear? from between when it opens at 20,000 kilometers per hour, because if the speed is very high, I think it's about the material of the parachute. Yeah, so the parachute doesn't open at 20,000 kph. It opens at around, let's say, I'm so bad going between English units and metric, but it probably opens at around, let's say, 1,300 kph. Um, so you first slow down from 20,000 kph, let's say down to 1,300 kph using the heat shield, using the aeroshell, and then you deploy the parachute. So that in Mach number is equivalent to two times the speed of sound. But because you know what that speed is, because you know what the area is, because you know what the density is where it's opening, you can calculate how much force it will see, and then you can design the parachute to be strong enough in terms of um, its material properties to handle that force. And so when you think about that in terms of a number, um, it's uh, 
65,000 pounds of force, uh, which is quite a lot, right? So um, that's how strong it has to be to be able to survive that opening load. But you can select materials such as Kevlar, which is what we used, and nylon and polyester that once you distribute that load across that large area, now all of a sudden it's something that the materials can handle. Um, so it isn't 20,000 kph, it's closer to 1,300 kph, and then the total load, and forgive me for going into English units, uh, is 65,000 pounds. But at least we can all appreciate what that is. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can see a question on the power aspect regarding rovers. Uh, how does the rover save power during extreme changes of weather on the surface of Mars? And with that, I'll also add another question. And since uh, Mar Martian surface has got a lot of extreme weather, and there is a possibility that even dust particles may get settled on the solar panels. So in that case, are there any new upcoming technologies being explored to clean the solar panels uh, from which rovers get power? Yeah, so the Mars does have weather, it has dust storms, it has global dust storms where, you know, the opacity, uh, the atmosphere, the ability to see the sun is significantly reduced. So one of the challenges of only having solar as your power source is that you have to design for these worst case scenarios where you see less of the sun and or you start to reduce less power over time as the Spirit and Opportunity rovers did um, because it gets all this dust deposition. So uh, Curiosity and Perseverance got around that because it doesn't use solar panels. It uses an RTG, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. So it doesn't care um, to see the sun. It doesn't need to see the sun. It's already generating its own heat because of radioactive decay of plutonium-238. So it has this really long half-life, like over 70 years. And so it's always putting out this heat it actually puts out so much heat, uh, it actually gets too hot. So it has to have a cooling loop to keep itself cool. So that's the way you get around that dust deposition. That being said, there are technologies under development that could use ultrasonics to actually push off some of the dust that might land. I've seen that um, at a particular company, I think it was Northrop Grumman um, in the United States, who was using this ultrasonic cleaning technique. You could even some use something as simple as a brush that might come across and wipe it off. And you could have something which would vibrate the particles off off, um, you know, using uh, some kind of, you know, intentional vibration mechanism. But we got around this um, with curiosity and perseverance by using this nuclear power source. Um, and probably a future human mission would have both. It would have backup nuclear power source, um, hydrogen fuel cells, as well as a very large solar farm. It kind of depends upon what your application is. Thank you. Uh, next question is by uh, Mr. Ankush Bhaskar. He's asking, uh, what are possible ways to terraform the Mars? Oh, what are possible ways to terraform? So I think people don't know yet um, how to do that. So I think what I would imagine is that instead of trying to terraform the entire planet, that you maybe you would pick some kind of cave system and try and do it there first. And then you would still have to have some way to maintain pressure. So maybe you would line the cave system with some kind of, you know, I don't know if it would be a polymer or something which would provide a seal, or you could put in an inflatable um, structure in there that fills up um, any of that region. And then you would sort of terraform a smaller environment first. I think we're very far away from knowing how to terraform at a planetary scale. I think just the sheer amount of material which is required to do that um, is very difficult. And the reason why the atmosphere got ripped away from Mars to begin with is because it doesn't have that magnetic field. It's always experiencing in space radiation which is coming in and taking um ripping off the atmosphere so you wouldn't want to spend all that effort if you couldn't keep the atmosphere that you created so that's another challenge um that i think the planet will always have because it doesn't have a magnetic field anymore so it's probably more likely that we'll have to create smaller regions subterranean or maybe under surface under domes like you saw in the image towards the end of the presentation but i think planetary level terraforming without re-establishing its magnetic field which i don't know how one does that at the planetary level i think that's a problem right uh, next question is by manasa uh, uh, the question is if we are uh, if we are to set a, a colony on the martian surface what part of mars would be the best suitable so 
I don't think we know the answer to that question yet. And so one of the reasons why we keep on exploring uh, different locations is to find out what would be the best location. But I think we can think about what it is that we need. So we want to probably want to be in a place at lower latitudes because at least it's warmer. Um, we would want to be in a location which would have access to one of these subsurface aquifers so we can get access to water. Um, so those are two things that we could think about. We probably would also want to be in a place um, that is uh, relatively flat uh, so that we can have an easier time of, of constructing equipment and getting around. So those are the things that we can think about. Um, and if you were a person trying to establish a first colony in some new location on Earth, you probably would pick something that was close to water, for example. So we don't have flowing water, but we do know there are subsurface aquifers. We'd want to be in one of those locations as well. Thank you. Uh, next question is by Mr. Vaibhav Raut. Uh, he's asking, human has, humans have landed on moon about 50 years ago. Why we are not able to build a base on moon so far? Wouldn't that be useful in human mission to Mars and for human solar system exploration? So that actually is the plan, right, which is to go back to the moon first uh, with the Artemis program um, to gain more experience of sending people to other planets and the technologies associated with that. Um, of course, the moon, um, you know, doesn't have an atmosphere, which means the technologies necessary to land people on the surface of the moon are different. The technologies needed to land people on the surface of Mars. But you would have the need to be able to protect yourself from radiation. You would have the need to be able to survive right in a pressurized environment so that is the plan is to go to the moon first before we go to planetary exploration to mars um, there are people who disagree who think we should go straight to mars um, i am of the camp if we don't have money to do both we should go to mars first if we have money to do both then we can do both <laughs> thank you uh, next question is by niharika she's asking in the recent mars mission nasa used helicopters so instead of helicopters would it work if they used hot air balloons um you know pro possibly the challenge of course is that uh because the atmosphere is so thin, I think it would probably just diffuse out far too quickly that you wouldn't be able to maintain um, the inflation. So you probably wouldn't want to use a hot air balloon. You would probably want to use a enclosed uh, balloon all right, and fill it up with the uh, lower uh, density gas than what is currently uh, the Martian CO2 gas. But I actually think a better platform is an airplane <laughs> because rotorcraft are terribly inefficient uh, because they don't, they're, they're lifting surfaces this tiny rotor blade Whereas with a wit with an airplane, you can have an incredibly large wingspan. So I think the better approach for aerial reconnaissance um, from an efficiency perspective is actually an airplane. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, next question is by Mr. Manthan Anand Jain. Uh, his question is: He wants to become aerospace engineer. How he can become aerospace engineer? Well, <laughs> the best way is to get a degree in aerospace engineering. So I think there are many universities um, all around the world that offer degrees in aerospace engineering. That being said, um, all of the work that I showed you today was done by aerospace engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, computer scientists, astrobiologists, chemists, physicists. So the space program has roles for many different types of engineers, depending upon what you're working on. So like guidance, navigation, and control, the people who created the autonomous landing system, like the software aspect, those are usually um, sometimes they're aerospace engineers if they're doing the flight control portion, or sometimes they're going to be electrical engineers. So there's a range of different disciplines that support the space program, but aerospace engineers usually work on thermal and fluid systems, on aerodynamic systems, and ironically, a planetary EDL has an atmosphere, but for going to the moon, for example, or an airless body, um, you don't have an atmosphere, right? So you don't have aerodynamic forces. So there are just so many different things that you can do, but the obvious answer to that question is to get degrees in aerospace engineering. And you certainly don't need to go and get your PhD unless you wanna do research. Um, I always, people, it's always good to have a PhD, obviously, uh, but you know, getting a bachelor's and master's degree in aerospace engineering, I would say would be uh, the best first step. Thank you. Uh, next question is about, uh, if we grow a uh, large amount of plants on Mars, uh, will we use the Martian water? Are nutrients there in Martian soil, uh, which plants might need for their growth? 
I didn't really understand that question, but um, extremophiles would be sort of genetically um, engineered plants that just produce a lot of O2 and don't need as much CO2. There are already plants like that that exist today, which have a a really large output of O2 um, and have a large consumption of CO2. So it would probably step like that and then slightly souped up. So I don't know what the names of those plants are, but what they're called as a group is extremophiles. And I didn't understand the first part of your question um, uh, beyond the plants. I think, uh, based, uh, I think the question is uh, how possibly we can use Martian water for growing plants on Martian oh. surface. Oh, okay. Um, well, you can just, use, as long as you have it in a liquid state, you can use it. So it's about tapping into it, collecting it somehow without it boiling off um, and then literally applying it, uh, right? Because it, there is gravity there. If you're in a pressurized environment, the boiling temperature won't be such that it boils immediately. Um, right? If it's temperature controlled, it won't boil immediately. It'll be fine. It'll be in a liquid state like storable. So you can just use it as you would here on earth. The only difference would be you would be in a pressurized environment, which means you wouldn't be out on the surface, you know, growing plants everywhere. Um, and uh, um, you're in a lower gravity environment. So maybe that will affect the amount of water the plant needs, but I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question. Yeah, I think there are a lot of questions and I think uh, at some point we have to stop. And uh, uh, with that, uh, I thank uh, Dr. Anita Gupta for accepting our invitation and uh, enlightening us on Mars and past, present, and future missions about Mars. And uh, I'm sure uh, maybe a day will come when we'll have such space talks directly being from Mars to Earth. Day is not far. <laughs> and, yes. uh, with that, uh, uh, I <laughs> and uh, with that, I invite uh, uh, Vaibhav Rao to officially go for a vote of thanks. Uh, over to you, Vaibhav. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay, yes. uh, it, it was great uh, to hear Dr. Anita Sen Gupta. Maybe after two years when she visited uh, Mumbai and we had opportunity to hear her, you know, in front of us in the Mumbai Press Club. And those memories are still alive. And we hope that we soon see you in Mumbai again. And uh, where, uh, in fact, we wanted to hand over the, you know, the momento because we are not able to send you <laughs> over the internet at the moment. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I uh, uh, the Space Geeks would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Anita Sen Gupta for inviting our invitations. And Space Geeks would like to thank the director of Nehru Science Center for accepting uh, our invitation to be a part of this event and hosting the event. Uh, Mr. Suhas Naik Satam for uh, National Communications. We thank uh, Suhas sir uh, for uh, being part of the event and uh, also to we thank Professor Anil Mathu from Indian Space Industries Exhibitor uh, for who uh, all came together to celebrate the World Space Week 2021. So uh, this uh, enthusiasm for the space exploration should go on. And I am happy to tell you that we have a more than 900 registered participants. And I believe that they will take an inspiration and motivation and, uh, and it, it, is, uh, it is that uh, this generation that will go and land on the uh, Mars for sure. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to say one more thing about the Space Geeks. Space Geeks is a unique startup, works in the field of space from Mumbai. With all this association, we plan to bring more such programs to you and keep the space open for everyone. And thanks all the students for your enthusiasm uh, and uh, uh, the participations. Stay connected with the Space Geeks and stay connected for more talks to come in this space, World Space Week celebration 2021. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night.